Hello and welcome. I'm Phil Torres, here to talk about innovations that can change lives. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique way. This is a show about science by scientists. Let's check out our team of hardcore nerds. Dr. Crystal Dilworth is a molecular neuroscientist. Tonight, a young woman murdered in a remote riverbed, a crime with few leads that went cold after 19 years. Now, a clue that could only come from science. Tonight, it's the real CSI, the latest innovations that are solving crimes like never before. Costa Grimanis is an engineer who's designed everything from satellites in space to bionic eyes. Tonight, he shows us everything you need to know about 3D printing. And I'm Phil Torres. I'm an entomologist. I study spiders in the rainforests of Peru. That's our team. Now let's do some science. Hey guys, I'm Phil Torres. Welcome to Techno. I'm here with Costa and Crystal. And Crystal, your story has the killer combination of a murder mystery, a stubborn detective, and science. Right. Tell me about it. We all enjoy watching crime scene investigation shows, but this is the real deal. I was looking at how new techniques in forensic science can influence how we're able to solve crimes, including a 19-year-old cold case. So let's take a look. Range is hot. Camera. Light. Clear. Wow. High speed cameras. If you cross light on it, then you can spot them like here. New ways to match DNA. Step back without contaminating any of the evidence. 3D models. Evidence invisible to the naked eye. The crime fighting of the future is here today. We begin our story about an hour southeast of Salt Lake City. We're near Midway, Utah. This is Wasatch County, along the banks of the Provo River. Sheriff Todd Bonner knows the river well, but not all of his memories are good ones. I was a patrol officer in 1995. Uh, call come in, you don't ever expect to have a call such as that. You kind of go blank for a few minutes. It was a December morning in 1995 when then-deputy Todd Bonner was called to the scene of a murder beside the Provo River. The body of 17-year-old Crystal Baslanowicz had been found badly beaten, and there were very few clues. It was a real-life whodunit. And soon after that, the case went cold. There are very few murders in Wasatch County each year, sometimes none. Probably one of the hardest cases I've ever had to, to deal with in my life. Back in 1995, Crystal's mother told a Utah newspaper her daughter left Spokane, Washington, and started working as a prostitute at age 15. But Bonner was determined to get her justice. There hasn't been a day go by that uh, I haven't thought about her, the crime scene, and I knew that the suspect uh, was out there possibly hurting someone else. Bonner did his best to keep the case alive, but he couldn't catch any breaks. We didn't have the manpower. We didn't have the technology to move forward with the DNA. For more than 15 years, the case was cold. But finally, thanks to new technology, Sheriff Bonner caught his break. I'd heard about touch DNA. One of my detectives wanted to know if we could submit some of the evidence that we had, see what we could come up with. The sheriff assigned the case to Lieutenant Brian Gardner. So many leads had been exhausted. We really didn't have anything to go on. With the advent of touch DNA, I thought it's possible. Hopefully we could find something off the evidence that we could test and get a DNA match. Crystal was killed with a rock like this one. Back then, deputies collected what they believed was the murder weapon. But at the time, they didn't have the technology to recover DNA for analysis. But now, a breakthrough. So how do you get DNA from a rock? Jared Bradley has the answer. He's the president of a company called MVAC Systems. His company makes the vacuum that extracted DNA from that rock. This system uh, enables the, the investigators to get into any kind of rough surface like 
uh, a rock or concrete where the DNA is not going to be uh, on the surface and readily available. So before uh, they were using swabs and if you swab a rock and the DNA is inside because it has little holes in it, you're not going to get it, but you're using a vacuum technique. Correct. It actually sprays solutionists and vacuums at the same time. It's literally creating a little mini hurricane down there for that DNA material. It's loosening the material so it can be vacuumed back up. Exactly. We can get a t-shirt here. If I was the suspect and I grabbed somebody just like this, I've transferred my DNA. Crystal Baslanovich case, they got some DNA samples from a rock. This is a typical Utah River rock. If this were to be um, used as a murder weapon, the suspect is going to leave uh, touch DNA, skin cells, and, and sweat, and that kind of thing on the surface of, of this rock. If you can't see it with the naked eye, those are the, the perfect samples for the MVAC system. From here, the sample gets sent to a lab for analysis. I'm here in the Colorado Rockies at one of the most unique crime labs in the world. Scientists here are bringing a personal touch to DNA analysis. The husband and wife team of Richard and Selma Eichlinboom set the gold standard of touch DNA analysis. Of course, a big problem here is that we have a lot of blood of the victim still present in the jacket. They run independent forensic service out of their home laboratory, often teleconferencing with their office in the Netherlands. I think if she was injured in a small space because she didn't have much wiggle room. They've worked some of the highest profile cases in the past decade, including Casey Anthony. And they've helped free innocent people from prison, including the first touch DNA exoneration in the US. They say their ultimate goal is truth finding. The big motivation is solving a case, getting the real perpetrator behind bars. It's awful to live with a crime somebody had committed to, to a loved one and not knowing what happened. Touch DNA comes from the outer layers of skin cells. When you touch someone with force, those layers shed. The more force you use, the more DNA left behind. There's sometimes about 20 cells. We work with much smaller amounts of DNA than, than, than 15 years ago. How does this process start? Well, we start by sterilizing all our equipment. They put the equipment in an ultrasonic bath, then a second one. Then they put it in an oven at maximum heat and seal it in a sterile bag. Richard is looking for any irregularities that he can see on the surface looking for uh, traces of blood or sperm or other bodily fluids. There's a reasonable chance that we can find DNA here. Besides murder cases, touch DNA is now used in sexual assault cases. For instance, a suspect who says he had come sexual contact with the victim, but it was not rape. Then you have to prove why was his genes torn in these locations. Once they've identified the area they want to test, they analyze it like regular DNA. The DNA profile is very informative, but that person has some explaining to do if it's not the husband. Then. Back in Utah, the DNA extraction worked, and investigators have a match through touch DNA. Suspect's name is Joseph Michael Simpson. He had been a resident of Utah back in the um, 80s, early 90s, and he had moved to Florida and has been there ever since. Simpson served time in the Utah State Prison for murder back in the 80s. Why didn't you ever give up on Crystal's murder? She was a young girl. You look at it as if it's your own child. Uh, I have three daughters of my own. Uh, if it happened to me, I would expect that law enforcement do everything they can to bring justice. I owed it to her parents. Tell me a little bit about what it was like for you to be able to make the phone call to Crystal's mother and let her know that, that she could have a little bit of that closure. It was very, very satisfying, one that uh, one I will treasure for a long time. It was very rewarding, to say the least.
I'm just amazed at the fact that they could vacuum up river rocks and find DNA on it. Right, so the resolution of these new technologies allows us to get usable information from just a few cells, as you saw. And this is really influencing the different types of crimes that we're able to solve, or at least get leads for. And recently, we've heard about a number of cases that have been thrown out because of improper handling of DNA evidence. Is, is this gonna be another problem? Right, so the technology doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? So we're relying on the training of the technicians that investigate the crime scene, that collect the evidence, and that do the analysis not to be contaminating it. So this is a huge issue. Now, Crystal, you just showed us how recent innovations in the field of crime scene investigations are really changing the field. But what do you think is coming up next? Right, so this I'm really excited about because I got a chance to geek out at John Jay University and talk to the professors there that are developing the new techniques that we're going to be seeing in crime scene investigation like the next 5, 10, even 20 years. So it's pretty exciting. Check it out. I'm here in the heart of New York City at John Jay College, where they train the best of the best of tomorrow's crime scene investigators. Professors here are at the cutting edge of forensic technologies to help them stay one step ahead of the criminals. On this campus, these men are rock stars. They teach crime scene investigation, and they created many of the technologies either used today or soon to be used in the future. Cameras, animations, and new science are revolutionizing the industry. This is a mock crime scene. You can look into this scene uh, and come to some conclusions. And one of the first things that we need to do is to determine whether they're alive or not. Lawrence Kobolinski is the head of this prestigious program. We want our students to develop the, the skills and knowledge that will make them good forensic scientists. We have to process the scene. Go around the scene again in a spiral pattern. We've identified all the physical evidence. We need to now package it, uh, document it, uh, and get it to the lab. What we're looking for is a linkage between the suspect and the victim, or between the suspect and the crime scene. The best ways, of course, are fingerprints and DNA analysis. But nowadays, crime scene investigators have to rely on something else. How is uh, new technology changing that process? And things that we do today weren't even thought about just a few years ago. We're in an era where we can bring instrumentation right into the crime scene uh, and not only collect evidence, but start to analyze it. This box is one of the biggest changes in crime scene investigation. It's a panoramic 3D camera. What happened at the crime scene? Okay, you could see the body on the bed. You could see there's a monkey wrench on that edge of the bed. It gives investigators and juries another perspective and allows them to digitally re-enter the crime scene long after it's been cleared. Leia is gonna fire at a piece of glass and we're gonna capture that moment in time with a digital high-speed camera to assess the dynamics of the bullet impact with the glass. How fast are we talking? Today we're gonna to shoot at 10,000 frames per second Range is hot. Camera. Light. Clear. Wow. What type of information are we going to be getting from we're that? We're going to see the bullet approach the glass in air, where it's in stable flight. Then we're going to see its interaction with the glass. The bullet's going to become destable at that point. We're also going to see the fracture patterns of the glass. The glass is going to have both radial and concentric fractures. Can you give me a real world example in a crime scene? A classic example is if an officer stops someone in a vehicle, if a shooting then transpires, who shot first? The person from inside the vehicle at the officer, or did the officer fire first at the person inside? This is just the tip of the iceberg. Microbiologist Nathan Lentz is testing human microbiome and other biological evidence that could one day solve crimes. We had him show off his work and grabbed a volunteer. We're going to have each of you smell a flower, and I'm not going to know which flower that was, 
but afterwards we're gonna swab your nose and see if we can detect which flower you had smelled. And this is going to be relevant to forensic work because sometimes we can deduce where someone was earlier in the day by what kind of biological agents they might carry with them. They might carry pollen that they smell from a type of flower or tree or weed, maybe dander from an animal or a pet. I'm gonna leave the room and you guys smell your flowers and we'll see if we can detect which, which ones you smell. First, our volunteer named Kezia is going to sniff a sunflower. Here I have a chrysanthemum, and I'm gonna smell it. We'll see how good his technique really is. So we've both smelled a flower. What do we do next? Now it's time to take a swab. And Stephanie here is gonna use a little cotton swab, and we're gonna pick up whatever pollen uh, we can from, from your nostrils. And of course, we'll pick up plenty of human DNA as well. Now she's gonna cut off the tip of this swab into a solution where we begin to extract the DNA. So what we're doing now is called vortexing. So the platform is shaking at a very high speed, which shakes the tubes, which causes the beads to move. It'll crash into the cells, break them open, and release the DNA. We're back in Nathan Lenz's lab nearly 24 hours after he swabbed our noses. Okay, according to our results, subject A, which was Kezia, we detected sunflower DNA in her nose. So I would say, Kezia, you snipped the sunflower. Am I right? Yes, you are. And our tests also found chrysanthemum DNA in the nostril of subject B, Crystal. Crystal, did you smell the chrysanthemum? Yes, I did. I thought so. <laughs> what excites you the most about it? It wasn't that long ago before you had someone's DNA, but it didn't match to something in the database. It was a dead end. But nowadays, by probing that DNA, we can actually learn potential information about the person. Once we collect some DNA, there's no limit to what we can learn. As these crime-fighting techniques are further developed, more criminals will be outsmarted by science and technology. What is your message to criminals? We're going to catch you. We're going to use science, and our science is getting better and better, so you might as well turn yourself in. So needless to say, it really seems we've come a long way from just drawing chalk around a body. But it also is a bit disconcerting that if I just brush up against something, they could get my DNA. And who knows what they could do with it. I mean, there's a lot you can do. Volunteering that type of information could also help make sure that you're not implicated in a crime. I am curious to see where that goes down the road and to see how juries can adapt to learning that kind of technology as it advances. Now, coming up next, Costa, you take a look at 3D printing. 3D printing. Uh, we went and took a look at all the greatest and latest new technologies that are revolutionizing how we make products. From heart valves to sugary treats, 3D printing on Techno. From trinkets and knickknacks, 3D fashion and food. The only limit is what you can think of. From automakers prototyping new parts to NASA launching a 3D printer to replace parts. For space exploration, this is absolutely a critical technology. From DIY medical solutions. And we see the people who've made the RoboHand project to create prosthetics that cost $5 instead of $50,000. To life-altering research. I'm Dr. Banasser, and my lab makes ears. It's alive when we put it into the printer. It's alive when it comes out of the printer. There are numerous 3D printer technologies, each responsible for tackling a design or engineering challenge. From creating the molds for a replacement knee to prototyping TV remotes, 3D printers aren't anything like your home printer. 3D printing is a process that makes physical objects. A 3D printer spits out droplets on a plate, gradually, layer by layer, building a three-dimensional object. So not a picture of a cup of coffee, but the coffee cup itself. Cornell University's Hod Lipson is a 3D printing pioneer. Every 3D print starts with a design file. Mm -hmm. The design file tells the printer what to print, how to print, where to put the material. So what you see here is the printed speaker. In any design software, you can go ahead and make changes. That information is then sent to the printer that prints layer after layer, hour after hour. So what do we have here? So what we have here is the first entirely 100% 3D printed consumer electronic device. It's a loudspeaker. Why is this a big innovation? We're beginning sort of the second chapter, moving from making passive parts to making integrated systems, things that, that have action, that can sense, react, do something. 
Last year, we created our first Manufacturing Innovation Institute in Youngstown, Ohio. A future that earned a shout out from the president. Where new workers are mastering the 3D printing. It has the potential to revolutionize the way we make almost everything. Across the Cornell campus, another revolution in 3D printing, one with life-saving implications. Heart valves are actually pretty complex geometry shapes. And if we use 3D printing, we can duplicate that shape. At the Biomedical Engineering Lab, researcher Laura Hockaday is working on a 3D printed pediatric heart valve. So if you could take stem cells from the pediatric patient and you could fabricate a living heart valve that would then be used as the prosthetic. So you just 3D print a valve with using the, the patient's own stem cells, put it in and it will grow with them. Yes, that's the idea. If it works, it would be life-changing for boys like nine-year-old Max Page. We noticed Max was in trouble when I went in for my 38-week appointment. They ended up taking him emergency C-section, and after about a day of testing, they discovered he had uh, Tetralogy of Fallot, which is a congenital heart defect. Max had his eighth surgery in 2012. So what was an adequate-sized connection between the heart and lungs at three months of age is not adequate for an active seven and a half year old boy. For Max, the valve is artificial, it won't grow with him. So when he gets to be a you know, late teen, he'll need a valve to, to match that size body. And then when he's a full adult, he'll need a valve for that size body. So the work at Cornell is very personal to the pages. It just makes me happy knowing that um, we have somebody else on our side. We talked to a family whose child uh, currently suffers from this condition, and they're so excited about the work that you're doing. Wow, this is a big responsibility. It's really exciting because I really do think that these technologies are so close to a breakthrough. So it might sound like it's years away and it might sound off in the distance, but for us, it's our, it's our future. It's our reality. And it's not just um, dreaming about kids that might be born today. It's, it's this kid right here. Across the country in Los Angeles, Liz and Kyle Von Haslin mix their design know-how with sugar, creating a 3D printing bakery in their home, the Sugar Lab. What the printer does when you hit play is it spreads out a very fine layer of sugar, and then it uses an inkjet printhead to come across that layer and basically paints with water wherever that model exists at that cross-section. And then it spreads another very fine layer of sugar and it paints the next cross section from the very bottom layer of the object to the very top layer until the whole model is built. It's really, it's a totally magical process. Then comes the fun part. We call this the excavation station. And that's because this is where we clean off all the excess sugar that's burying the model right now. This is like the most delicious air I've ever breathed. <laughs> <laughs> It looks like you annihilated some sections of it there. I know how to get rid of these damaged goods. And, uh, <laughs> delicious. <laughs> All right, Costa, so tell the truth. What did 3D printing taste like? Delicious, and I actually have some 3D printed treats for you guys to try. Those are amazing. <laughs> Candy of the future. No way. It's no, like a work of art. Yeah, bite, bite in, bite in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like a big clump of uh, pixie stick. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd love to see how 3D printing could actually be incorporated into crime scene investigation. And I'm sure that's right around the corner, and we here at Techno will be sure to cover it. So tune in next week for more innovations from the field, Techno. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and more.